So what exactly is a convertible telescope? And here we are with the CN212 atop my Celestron CGE mount. What is it? Well, it's a telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. There's an 8-inch mirror at the back which collects light and diverts it to a secondary mirror here which focuses the light out towards the eyepiece. This is where you put the eyepiece and this is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. So what's so special about this telescope? Well, it's a convertible. That's right, it's two telescopes in one. You can swap out the secondary mirror for a second one that they give you, and what it does is instead of diverting the light out towards the eyepiece here, it sends the light back through a hole in the primary mirror and out to this port here. So yes, this telescope has two places to put eyepieces, here and here. But the interesting part doesn't even end there. Look carefully at the eyepiece port here, and there isn't a focuser there. It's just a hole in the tube. No, you always focus back here. So it takes a little bit getting used to. Your eye's going to be up here, and then you've got to put your hand over down there to focus the telescope. So I like collecting old telescope brochures, and here's one for the CN212. A Newtonian Cassegrain, enjoyable in two-way. The back of the brochure also promises it's good for pleasant astrophotography. So the telescope is listed as a Newtonian and a Cassegrain. In Newtonian mode, it's an 8-inch f3.9, 820 millimeter or so focal length telescope. In Cassegrain mode, it's an 8-inch f12.4, 2630 millimeter telescope. If I were to guess, I would think that they designed this thing first as a Cassegrain and then added the Newtonian function later. The reason for that being that the focuser and the finder are down towards that end, and there's a very small nameplate in the back here that lists the focal length as 2630 millimeters. That is the focal length in Cassegrain mode. There's no mention of Newtonian mode at all. Okay, so let's demonstrate replacing the secondary. I have to confess, the first time I did this, I was a little nervous, and I told the owner this, and he encouraged me. He says, no, no, you have to do it and even told me that he has done this himself several hundred times. So right now it's in Newtonian mode. That's the Newtonian secondary. This is the Cassegrain secondary, and they've given you a nice little holder here so you can put that in there. But there's a knurled knob here, and I don't know if you can see this, but there's a little key right here, and that key fits into a slot on this side. So what you do, Loosen the neural knob like this, grab the secondary, it comes out. That's the secondary for the caster grain here. Again, there's the key. You just kind of feel around until the key goes in. And there you go. So it retains its collimation really well. I also had the question as to whether you have an advantage in using the secondary for the Cassegrain because the central obstruction is smaller. Well, yes, the mirror is actually a couple of millimeters smaller in diameter, but they use the same diameter holder, so you're not getting any advantage that way. But that's it. It's pretty simple. Now, they don't make these anymore. When they did, they cost around $4,599 new, and depending on what accessories you bought with it, you'd probably wind up spending around five grand. On the used market today, these do turn up occasionally. They're somewhere in the $3,000 to $3,500 price range used, depending on condition and what comes with it. If you do buy one used, be sure you get the necessary accessories. Right now, it's in Cassegrain mode, and this is the holder for the Newtonian reflector secondary. It also should come with a collimator. It's got a sight tube on it like this. There is a better collimator that's much longer. It looks like a probe. That's a really marvelous device for collimation, by the way. It's extremely accurate, and you can collimate this in the daytime, and it's dead on. The downside of that device is it costs several hundred dollars. Also, they make a field flattener that goes in here for Newtonian mode to take images. 
So if you're curious how you do this, I put the field flattener, this is one of my Canon 6Ds, and you open up the focuser like this, and it goes on just like that, and away you go. So there's a problem I ran into here, and it's probably unique to my situation. There actually isn't as much focus travel in this mirror as there are in, say, a typical schmidt cassegrain There's, you know, a fair amount of movement, but not as much as you might expect. And based on the number of expansion tubes and the plane of focus on this kind of camera, I found I actually couldn't find the correct plane of focus unless I pulled this out and then clamped it by the very edge of the field flattener. And I'm talking about the last one millimeter, if not even less. So one night I did this and I did manage to get this image of the Orion Nebula, which I like a lot. But when I went back the next night to try to do this again, I found I couldn't clamp it towards the end enough. In fact, I was almost tier near the end of the travel of the field flattener itself, and I was afraid the whole thing was gonna come tumbling down on me, so I didn't do any more deep sky photography in Newtonian mode because of that. Again, that's probably an anomaly of my situation with my camera. You may not have that issue. So I also did try running some experiments with deep sky imaging through the Cassegrain mode, both with and without the field flattener. Now the owner told me that it probably wouldn't be great because this was designed before the era of digital imaging, and he was right. It seemed to be operating somewhat slower than the f12.4 f ratio would indicate, and by the time I picked up the signal, like you see here in the Horsehead Nebula, the background was starting to interfere with it, and I even had this weird anomaly here. If you can see on the left side of this image, it almost looks like it's picking up a reflection on the camera sensor itself. Kind of interesting. But I did get this image of M1, the Crab Nebula, that I liked. Again, ran some experiments here, and then I, I didn't do much more of that. So that's deep sky imaging. The moon and the planets, a completely different story. I have to say, this could be the very best telescope I've ever used on the moon, both visually and photographically. Night after night after night, I couldn't wait to get out and look at the moon through this thing. The Terminator was moving, and I would make a list of things I wanted to look at, and it never disappointed. It even turned me into a kind of a mini researcher of my own. So here's an image of Copernicus, one of the most popular craters on the moon, and you don't normally see it in that configuration, all shrouded in darkness like that. That's one night. The very next night, less than 24 hours later, that's the way it looks. That's probably the way that you're accustomed to seeing it. But anyway, even looking at the moon from the same night, from one hour to the next, and if I stayed out long enough, you could see the shadow of the Terminator changing things on the surface of the moon. It's really, really terrific. So through the years and talking to those of you out there who own one of these things, most of you appear to be using it in Cassegrain mode. Me, I was sort of half and half on this thing. I'd go from one to the other, and it seemed like no matter what mode I was in, I would want to use it in the other mode. So if I was in Newtonian mode, I would think, oh, you know what, something is really something I want to do in Cassegrain mode, and vice versa. So in a way, the telescope was kind of keeping me from using itself. That's a good sign, I think. By the way, when I pointed this out to a friend of mine, he said, well, you know, Ed, the solution to that is very obvious. Just, you know, go out and get two of these. You also see this telescope mentioned as a serious research tool. The owner of this one has done spectroscopy with it, and he has personally logged over 10,000 variable star observations with it. So are there any drawbacks to this? Well, other than the cost, uh, there's a finder on this other side there. You can't see it. By the way, Takahashi finders are renowned for their optical excellence. This one is no exception. It's a 7 by 50 illuminated crosshair finder, and the, it's sharper than most telescopes that I've seen. Almost a shame to move from the finder to the main telescope itself. So in some ways, it's almost a three-way telescope. But I found I didn't love aligning the thing. The alignment procedure is complicated and it's imprecise, which is a little bit out of place for the rest of the excellence of this telescope. What you have to do is loosen a collar and then with it half loose, you're supposed to half tighten the Allen keys. 1.5 millimeters, by the way, very small Allen keys. Then you tighten it more and then sort of an iterative process where you tighten everything up eventually. And I found it was always off just a little bit. Another thing to watch it for is the weight of the tube. Depending on what you have on it, it's between 25 and 28 pounds. You're going to need 
a good mount, and especially a good telescope like this, the bigger the mount, the better. I'm talking a CGEM Atlas class mount, a Lozmandy G11 class mount, something in that range as a bare minimum. So this CGE is based on Lozmandy G11 parts, so it does hold this thing fairly well, but even this, at higher magnifications, I found, you know what? I could use maybe just a little bit more mount. I did run some brief experiments with this on a mid-size mount. I put it on a Vixen dovetail plate, and I put it on my Celestron CG5 and AVX mounts. Uh, no, you don't want to do that. Along with the jittery, shaky views, I was concerned about mechanical stability, and I was concerned about burning out the motors, so I stopped that experiment fairly fast. So I have to say, subjectively, this is some of the most fun I've had with a telescope in a very long time. As the evening got close and it was clear out, I just couldn't wait to get out there and try to do stuff with it. Okay, so let's say you want one of these things. I don't blame you. What are you going to do? They don't make them anymore. Well, you could wait until one comes up for sale, and again, be prepared to spend 3000 to 3500 for the optical tube, and again, you want to have a nice solid mount to put it on. But in the interim, there is something that you can do. They make 8-inch F12 classical Cassegrains. These are Chinese source products. You can get them from Orion and TPO and GSO and the usual suspects. They run you about $1,000. You can also buy an 8-inch F4 Newtonian separately. Those run five to six, $700 by themselves. And again, you get them from the same suppliers. So you could spend you know, $1,500 to $1,700, get two different telescopes that duplicate the operation of this one, and you're still spending about half what you would have on one of these things. If you shop very carefully, you could buy both those telescopes and two mid-sized go-to mounts, like say an AVX class mount, and you could still be under what you would pay for one of these things used. Now, you're not getting handmade Japanese quality, you're not getting the bragging rights that, coming, that comes with a Takahashi, but you know, you could duplicate the functionality for about the same amount of money. Something to consider. So there you have it, an overview of the Takahashi CN212 convertible Cassegrain Newtonian. This one's got to go back to its owner. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that, but he's probably got some more research he wants to do with it. If you're fortunate enough to own one of these, let us know what you've done with it. I'm sure we'd all like to hear. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.